Good well, morning. Good, good morning. <laughs> Happy 2022. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of California. And these are monthly live webinars that I do talking about all things relationships and I guess personal development as well. I try to provide you all the education, research tools that we just never learn in school, how to do relationships, how to manage high crisis conflict, uncovering uh, addictions and other mind-blowing things within our family system or our loved ones. I specialize in betrayal trauma and how to navigate that. So this is a webinar talking about all of those things. And today we're going to focus in on the four most common stress responses that we have to trauma, to threats, to whatever is unpredictable. So this will be a discussion on the fight flight, freeze, and fawn stress responses, but spending extra time talking about the fawn, or as we also call it, the please and appease trauma stress response. Um, because as many, um, many of the people who are attending this webinar are in a heightened state of stress, whether it's because in their microcosm world, of um, their relationships, their significant other. A lot of these people are betrayed partners or in um, recovery from addiction and other multi-leveled complexities and conflicts and struggles. In a, in a macro world, we're dealing with long-term stress from pandemics, lots of unpredictability, lots of threat, um, lots of concern. So sometimes we feel like our world and our environment and our body is controlling us rather than our best thinking and our rational thought and, and our values and goals of knowing how we want to show up as a human, how we want to show up um, with our loved ones, et cetera. And as I always say, education is the empowerment tool, right? The more I can help you understand what is happening neurobiologically within your mind, body, your wiring, your hormones, your chemistry, um, the more you can take steps to undo what is no longer working for you or better understand why things are happening within your own life or your engagement with others. So with further, without further ado, let's talk about the fawn or Please and a please trauma response. So let's first talk about what is trauma. Sorry, forgot my book right here. What is trauma? Um, let's say this is, I want you to expand your understanding of the word trauma. Um, I think we like to think about um, punching, kicking, violence, someone being held at gunpoint, where the threat is extremely obvious that, you know, death is possible and peril is overwhelming, but you have to understand your brain is lazy. So your brain in an effort of keeping you alive will interpret many things as potentially life-threatening. It rather just kind of put a general swath over everything. Um, like I use the example sometimes those Newfoundland, big puffy white, they're like St. Bernard dogs, but they're gigantic and they're black. And there's been some times where I'll look at one far away and it'll look like a bear um, because my brain is not wired to be accurate. It is wired to be efficient in keeping me alive. Um, my prefrontal cortex, which takes a lot more blood flow, a lot more oxygen is wired to be more accurate. But that back brain that comes on a lot faster than this part of my brain is wired to just very generally tell me this is a potential threat. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So take a minute to expand as you're exploring, okay, what are my potential stressors and struggles in life right now? Hopefully I can help you expand that. So a traumatic event or a stressful experience is loosely based on one main thing, your nervous system gets overwhelmed. So it gets feedback from this world. If you think of your, your body as kind of an enclosed nervous system, you know, it's these cells and atoms that are kind of bumping into other humans and other things in this world. And it's kind of responding to what you're seeing and what you're experiencing and what you're hearing and what you're feeling. And, and it's a feedback loop system. It is basically 
any time trauma, you experience trauma and stress or struggle and strife, anytime it, it is shocked that nervous system. Um, we move along life in a predictable manner, or we try to, um, we like comfort. We like predictability that equals safety to us that allows us to kind of move along in our high executive functioning space. Um, but anything that overwhelms your nervous system is initially experienced as trauma and stress, anything that catches you off guard. So anything that's unpredictable, you thought something was supposed to be this way. You thought you knew this about this person. You thought you were supposed to drive to work without any incident and suddenly it went wrong. Um, it is something you don't feel prepared for or know how to handle. Um, and it can make you feel scared or helpless or confused. Confusion's a more accessible word sometimes. It can lead you to feel shameful and more disconnected from the world. So this is what's setting me apart from everybody. This is what's making me different. This is why I'm not valuable. This is uh, evidence of how much someone doesn't love me or how I can trust people who lie to me and harm me, right? That's all the shame and disconnection experience. You experience moments when you're not sure that you're gonna make it through the event. Um, there's, there's this word about loss of context and time. So there's this moment like such as again, this pandemic, it helps explain trauma so much easier now, it's more accessible to everybody. But this overwhelming idea of like a helplessness and a lack of control, that's partly why it's traumatic. But another thing is, is like, when will this end? You know, this, when will I go through a 24 hour period without crying or, or being stressed about this particular incident in my life? Or going back to the pandemic, when will I go 24 hours without talking about the pandemic, thinking about it, being impacted by it? That, that um, lack of context, of, of what's happening at me, to me, how much longer do I have to endure? That creates a long-term stress response. Um, so, and then there's this other concept. So that's a singular traumatic event, right? That can just happen in a singular time, a car accident, a scary moment. Um, but then there's this idea of complex trauma. So if I grew up in a um, family system where there was lots of unpredictability. I didn't know when there was going to be an emotional explosion or there's addiction or mental health instability or financial insecurity, or I lived in a community where there was a lot of um, unpredictable, scary things that occurred. That can create complex trauma. And this is important for you to understand your body wires around your experiences and creates adaptive responses for how to continue on in life despite this trauma from recurring, right? How to survive it. So remember that as I talk about the fight, flight, freeze and fawn response because above all else, none of this is supposed to be shaming, right? How you show up in these moments of high conflict, stress and struggle. Understanding your autonomic nervous survival responses, your innate default settings, they're just highly adaptive ways that you learned how to survive, right? You have 100% evidence to this day, to this moment, that you can make it through the day. And, and part, part of the reason why is because you've used you know, one of these four or all of these four responses in the state of unpredictability, stress, and struggle. So this is just meant to be educational, not blaming or shaming. So let's talk about that. That um, there, let's talk about the fight, fight, or freeze response. Um, I like using this metaphor. Um, so this is a background on Peter Levine is someone who's done a lot of research on animals of how they've responded to, um, ooh, my light just went out, more unpredictability. Um, <laughs> now I'm in the dark. So um, they studied animals and just understanding the way that they respond to stress, right? And see if they could um, correlate it to humans. And so let me use an example of a seal happily, you know, going about in seaweed and then senses danger. So um, let's start with, so first a animal senses that there's a threat, 
So again, remember that wide swath general application of maybe they saw a shadow, maybe they saw something move. So the seals bobbied about in the seaweed and it hears, or maybe it hears other seals running away, right? Because don't forget we're, we're, we're meant to uh, pick up other people's states, right? Or other animals states of panic, because that might give us a cue that something's wrong and something's bad and I need to act, right? So the seal picks up that something's not right. And suddenly they get a flow of like, pay attention, move to your sympathetic nervous system, start figuring out how you need to respond to this threat. You know, you need to assess further. Then when that they do some quick, quick, really back of your brain, millisecond assessment, find out, yes, there is a shark coming at me. Um, it's a threat. I need to um, respond in fight, flight, freeze, and then we'll talk about the fawn, but unless you're a social animal, you usually don't respond with a fawn. So if there is anger or frustration, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Let's first talk about animals. That, so a seal is not gonna be able to talk their way out of getting eaten. They're not gonna be able to fight their way out of getting eaten. Um, if they freeze, they will absolutely be eaten. So the only option in that exact millisecond moment is flight. So they are flooded with a bunch of um, chemicals and hormones that will help them move quickly um, and run away. When the body system is overloaded with that rapid heart rate, heart rate lack of oxygen, um, the body starts releasing um, natural opiates. So if you guys are familiar with the opioid addiction, the opioid is it is a pain blocker. And we actually have natural pain blockers that are called opiates, and they they exist naturally in our body. And believe it or not, if you watch like a National Geographic, when you watch the lion kind of run after the gazelle and finally catch it, you notice that the gazelle will tend to go limp. And that's because it is being flooded with opiates, either preparing it for death or just because it, the oxygen and the heart rate has gone too long, too far, and it can't run anymore. And so you'll kind of notice it almost die without it actually dying. Now, if by some chance that animal is able to escape death, um, like in the National Geographic, I saw two um, hyenas or somebody start fighting with each other and it distracted them from getting at the animal. And it went from this complete dead state to just all of a sudden hopping back alive and dashing out again um, because it perceived that it had a chance to fly away or to flight one more time and it got away. So if that happens, they, then it is goes, once it gets into its safe state, it actually starts convulsing and shaking off what just happened. Like literally, you know, like when a dog shakes off the water on their body and it helps release the chemicals and the hormones of that fight, flight, freeze state that it was flooded with. And then it carries on in life, kind of joins the herd again, goes back to the seaweed and joins his seal friends. Um, so meaning that there's a kind of beginning, middle and end state for wild animals. Unfortunately, um, and fortunately, since we are social creatures, the engagement of other human beings. So not just this obvious predator of this greater apex predator is the obvious um, threat that we need to avoid because we're such social creatures, we, just even loving somebody and in being in relationship with somebody can be a potential threat to us. So let's talk about the four, um, responses that we might experience depending on our, our experience with other people. So if we perceive an experience because by the way, it's all about perception. It's not about what reality is. It's based how I perceive the tone of voice, the perceived attacker, the perceived attack, the perceived conflict, the perceived environment, how they're viewing me. That is all um, cues that my brain takes in. So if I experience it in anger and frustration, I will probably fight, right? So if I, and I perceive that I can assert any kind of power over in the situation, or I have a fighting chance, I'm a fight. Um, if I'm in a state of terror, or alarm, and a severe threat, and I'm not going to be able to um, fight, I will fly. I will get out flight. If I perceive it um, in a state of like despair, desperation, um, I've 
checked all the exits. There's no way out. I'm stuck here. High anxiety, um, just sheer exhaustion of, you know, my, my nervous system being just completely exhausted. I'm going to move into freeze state. Another word for that is we talk about dissociation. So sometimes you'll hear about that where it's just a numb out state. I feel nothing. I think nothing. I process nothing. I'm dissociation, I'm dissociated. And then the last one that we've really only been talking about for recent years is what we call the um, fawn state. So the please and appease state where it is solely social animals that will even bother doing this. Um, because let me tell you, the the please appease fawn responses come from highly social adaptive skills. So you will only see it in maybe humans where we're highly adaptable, or you can see it sometimes like in dog behavior with like where you go to the dog park and a, a new dog, a big one comes out another one and they kind of fawn and, and like say, Hey, don't worry. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to bite you. And they will, they'll fawn because they are also social creatures or they'll fawn with um, humans depending on the situation. So the please appease or fawn response is a highly skillful neurobiological survival mechanism where we've assessed the engagement going on with the person who's considered the aggressor, the perpetrator, the person who's maybe the one leading the high conflict experience. They're the ones who are bringing on the stressful event or someone who has the power over that person. They will assess that situation and respond to it with providing cues of, hey, hey, I'm on your team. Hey, you know, whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever I need to say to avoid conflict entirely, shut it down, pretend everybody's fine and happy. Um, and like, I'm the trustworthy one, I'm your teammate. But the issue is that it's done in a more manipulative way, right? Because what you're doing is you're subverting and pushing down your own feelings and opinions and experiences um, to kind of just de-escalate the situation, please and appease that person um, and or avoid the stress of the conflict in general. I mean, we're gonna be talking about that because remember not all conflict is bad, especially in a long-term relationship, sometimes, we need that space to talk about uncomfortable things and, and things that, that you're not okay with or resentment that builds up, et cetera. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So please, peace and fawn responses are the act of trying to connect with that perpetrator, aggressor, however you wanna state that person, the person creating the stress in your body. Um, you tr trying to connect with them and please them kind of make them happy, but it's in an, in an inauthentic, ingenuine way. So the goal, remember, it, if you've watched my videos long enough, the goal is always to be fully integrated, right? If we fast forward to the end of the story of lots of hard work and personal growth and relational growth, the goal is to be your good, bad, light, dark, and get to show up in your intimate relationships and talk about hard things, celebrate great things, um, struggle with each other, but love each other in spite of our flaws. We kind of walk into the sunset together as perfectly imperfect humans. So the reason why the please and a please stress response might not work for you in most situations is because you're subverting your real experience. You're pushing down cues of oh, this isn't uncomfortable, this is uncomfortable, this isn't working for me, I'm not okay with this. And you you continue to push it down. And there's a lot of people who, um, it, this started in their childhood and they learned often to please and please because maybe mom would explode so much that they'd be the, the funny, sarcastic kid to kind of distract the family system or they were just always the one that never had needs because there was enough people in the family system who had plenty of needs. So I'm gonna be the one who needs nothing, never shares my feelings, never has anything other than good news to bring to everybody. Um, 
and they pretend to be happy and okay in order to with the hope of connecting with humans, but in a manipulative way of trying to not have anything bad happen try not to have conflict come upon me and have to deal with the discomfort of that. So here's a few things. Uh, if anyone has ever heard of Stockholm syndrome, um, when I was doing some research on this, I thought it was interesting. People were, were saying that Stockholm syndrome can sometimes be um, better explained by that please appease fawn response. So if you remember, it's if, you know, if you've been kidnapped or a perpetrator has kind of like taken you on as a hostage situation, there'll be people who kind of start aligning themselves with the, the perpetrator and they call that Stockholm syndrome. But they said, you know, really, it's actually a highly adaptive, skillful technique that they used to survive that experience because they learned to say, hey, I'm not gonna run away. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, sure, I align with you, whatever you say, because the, the calmer they can keep the perpetrator, you know, by saying, no, no, you don't need to kill me, you can trust me, I'm your teammate, you can really appreciate how highly adaptive and skillful that is. The other thing I want to add in is, um, as I was doing more research on this, it was pointing out too that there's this stigma that we have culturally about being a fake person. You know, I think um, Freud, Freud called the defense mechanism sublimation. When you really don't like somebody and you're like, oh my God, hi, how are you? And then you're just like, oh God, I hate that person. But really that is a version of that fawn, please appease kind of state that you don't feel safe with that person. And it certainly doesn't feel safe for you to have an engagement with them and say, look, we had a really uncomfortable situation. Let's have a hard conversation about it. Let's even get to the other side. If that's not accessible because that person does not have emotional competency, they've not shown themselves to be safe and have hard conversations and survive it without using mean words or, you know, exploiting you or your vulnerabilities, then you are safer to be using that adaptive skill, skill of just pleasing and peasing, moving on. So I'm really trying to help you reframe some of these concepts around the skills, the social skills that you use to survive. Um, one of the common things that I see in betrayed partners is kind of post uncovering um, the addiction. That of course is the time where we start, okay, now that I've had all the information that I've been denied because my partner's been living a double life, we start reflecting all right, wh what was going on? What did I miss or what should I see? Or you have a new lens, right? Like I said, crisis kind of is like a sift and it makes everything fall to the side. And at that point, you're just, what's left is you're just assessing your family, your relationships, trying to figure out how did it all go wrong? What happened? How can I set my life up with boundaries and safety and a better understanding so I can survive in the future? And so, looking at these moments, these exchanges with your partner are just an understandable step when you're, when you're trying to heal. And so one of my um, clients was talking about an example of her please and appease was that she was sitting at a dinner table and though she didn't know her husband was acting out sexually, that was a whole hidden double life. It would manifest in their family system as just, um, not rage, but he would just sit down at the dinner table and just start nitpicking at the kids um, and just start going at them, right? So kind of that addictive behavior where I'm not talking about the fact that, oh, I feel shameful and regretful of all the nefarious behaviors that I've been doing behind your back and I feel yucky inside and I'm gonna be honest and transparent and process it in a healthy way. All those yucky feelings come out and why'd you get an F on the test? Or why are you chewing with your mouth open? Or why are you always late? Or things like that, because it's just, that's the way he's showing up in the relationships. So she became very hyper vigilant of reading his body language and knowing, right? Because in her socially adaptive um, skill set to, to maintain peace and keep her kids safe, she learned to pick up those cues and just either start doing alignment or kind of throwing in funny jokes to, to minimize the conflict and adversity that could have erupted at the dinner table. 
Um, so it's really important for you to explore that because let me say, and I'll close this up right now, is that therapists might do more harm when they're doing couples therapy and they don't really appreciate these fight, flight, freeze, fawn responses as highly adaptive skills. You know, you adopted them for, for a reason. They worked at some point for you. And so it can do more damage if you go into couples therapy and they just said, oh, well, you just need to assert yourself. You just need to say, hey, I'm not okay with you talking to the kids um, like that. You need to do X, Y, and Z, right? We need to first better understand the relationship di dynamic. Um, how, how do you talk about hard things? How do you disagree? Or most importantly, how do you repair? Is there any repair within that relationship dynamic where you can assert, can assert yourself, right? You can um, say your opinion or feelings or how something can be handled better or things that you resent. There's a long, long buildup to the place where you can actually assert yourself. So just be careful of that, right? The, the opposite response to fawn and peasing and pleasing is not all of a sudden like, this is how I feel and I won't accept anything less than this and these are my boundaries because obviously it, it worked at some point and you really need to actually un unwind and and better you know do like a relationship dialysis of of how that served your relationship dynamic and how you can slowly pull it apart and come up with better ways so let's talk about some things to start asking yourself as a as a closing as you think about this fawn please appease response and how it shows up maybe in your life is do you tend to smile or kind of act like nothing's wrong or find yourself be very hyper vigilant when there's any kind of conflict or inappropriate comments that occur within any relationship. Um, how long back can you remember responding this way? Kind of with this, like, I need to pretend everything's okay. Okay, how can I make this comment to pull us out of this? Or how can I um, recover for this whole family system or this relationship system and make everyone happy again or, or get out of this conflict. And specifically, who do you do this with, right? Again, usually it's someone with an uneven power dynamic where there's a power over. Um, so was it with like just your father or was it with someone that you like a, a very sensitive friend that you had to kind of help her or him feel more safe or comfortable? or one of your children, right? Like start thinking about that. Is there a particular person that you do approach with this hypervigilant of, uh-oh, they're angry or upset or not doing well. How, you know, what kind of clown suit do I need to put on to, to do the, the fun jig and get them in a, a happier state? Um, like it's, it feels like a hypervigilance when you think about this, like you're really picking up on cues and tone of voice and you're thinking about, instead of being like, what's going on with them? Why are they, right? Instead of looking at them like a feedback loop of why are they so unsafe? Why are they so angry? What's going on here? And kind of check in there. Um, you're thinking of, okay, what kind of strategies can I use to bring joy and happiness and pleasure and appeasing? Like that's what your thought process is instead. Um, can you think back to the last time you felt this way? So um, it, it, when you take the, if you take this back to your therapist's office, Think if you can think back to a scenario where you felt this way, you know, like you knew you're going to an event where you were going to run into someone where you didn't feel safe with them, or, you know, you've had conflict and you imagine yourself just moving to that pleasing and appeasing state, or maybe someone in your professional or personal life or hierarchy where they made an inappropriate comment or they're clearly disgruntled and how you try to move in to do that pleasing appeasing. So really just taking that scenario and seeing if you can kind of start pulling apart your feelings and your stories that you're telling yourself and how you can better show up more authentically, so to speak. The goal is to identify if and when this happens, this fawn response, explore the story that you're telling yourself around it, and how would you prefer to show up? Is this working for you? Because sometimes the answer is yes, it works. Um, but sometimes it's not, right? And your primary relationship usually doesn't work. With the random woman that you run across at school that you just don't like, you might need to keep that fawn response. That's fine. Um, and is it safe to, to move into a more authentic way, you know, a more vulnerable way of sharing your thoughts and feelings rather than just pleasing and appeasing? Um, 
So that is it for now. And let's open it up for questions. So yes, if you have questions, type them in the Q and A and we do, but I have not heard of this fawn. I mean, fight, flight, or freeze, like I've known about for years and years, but, but this makes so much sense, um, you know, as another coping mechanism and un well, no, fortunately I can, I can see how I've used that, you know, in many different scenarios. Some, like you say, you know, the random person that is just uncomfortable and, you know, not worth engaging with. But even in my family system, I was like, oh, yeah, like I was the person that deflected, like I will deflect the energy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it, it, it's just fascinating to, to even con consider. And you're talking about animals. And I was like, oh, my God, my dog is a you know, I mean, you know, we're walking down the, running down the street and there's a noisy truck and he's, you know, trying yeah. to, yeah, he's moving away or, you know, the other dog starts barking and then they join in together. Cause now we've all been alerted that, you know, it's danger, you know, the Amazon truck might be coming, you know, so, I mean, whatever it is, but you know, all of these, you know, responses, you know, my dog has great emotional um, intelligence. Uh -huh. He is, he is able to cue in and he reacts to dogs. You know, he's very much the chameleon. You want to play like this? Okay. I'll play like this. You know, mm -hmm. it's so like, I had this great visual of like, Oh, like, you know, like that chameleon of like, I'm going to navigate this. So my world is safe, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, maybe not being, well, he's a dog, but he, you know, he's his authentic self all the time, probably, but, but still, you know, to show up in those, those different ways, um, uh, you know, is, is a coping mechanism, you know, but yeah, losing our authentic self. I thought it was really useful too, when you're talking about like just going to the absolute opposite right off the bat without exploring you know how does this fabric all put together and what's going to be safe to move into a different way of communicating is really meaningful because you know an abrupt jarring you know can be unsafe you know you know yeah. for the entire system so so well, I think and you're really not going to be very good at it right if that's <laughs> right. been your default setting um I always joke that when I was learning to assert myself right um I I swung over to the other end and I just became an extremely unpleasant person <laughs> you know, like, I was like whatever you want to eat wherever you yeah, want to go to be like yeah. no one tells me yeah. where I eat dinner <laughs> I'm the one right yeah. and it's like yeah. it's a very slow response to like yeah. get to that middle spot yeah yeah. How do we navigate this being curious? The story I'm telling, my, I love when you share the story I'm telling myself because, you know, and you share too. It's like, it's not about reality. It's about perception. So it really is what we perceive the world to be in the moment, which can be completely opposite of what the reality is, but taking those few, you know, taking the time to process and letting blood get to the front part of our brain, um, you know, is, you know, it's difficult to do in the moment, you know, especially if we're in, you know, if we've gone to one of these spots. So, um, so, so questions. Um, my husband, the addict is extremely conflict avoidant, which results in fawning, very non-relational. Any recommendations for how to deal with this as a partner? Well, for better or worse, the non-addict in the relationship usually has to be the more emotional intelligent. Um, so sometimes it's more helpful now that you're, you have this education is to kind of bring this up. Like it's, um, and I try to do this with like my teenage kids too, that just also don't have the emotional intelligence yet to talk about, like, they'll just be mean and not know that they're like stressed about something. So it's just a quiet suggestion. Like, hey, I'm noticing, I'm asking this question um, and you don't seem to have an opinion. You don't seem to have any response, but I could imagine it's kind of a big deal. Like I would think you would have a response to this. Is it like, I'm ready for it. You know, but again, these are things, especially for an addict in recovery. Like I said, there's so much to unravel about how this served your husband, this, this fawn response, there might be a lot, especially immediately after, uh, uh, uncovering addiction, they're in a lot of state states of shame and sometimes, and they won't feel like they have the right to like an opinion. They won't feel like they have the right to share something, or they're just completely conflict avoidant because emotions are so high, but ironically, you kind of have to get through that and deal with the emotions and share what was going on. So usually 
it suggested that in the novice stages of recovery, you have hard conversations with a therapist present so they can help um, guide along someone who's more uh, conflict avoidant and kind of help them make kind of grow a better understanding of how they feel, that they're even having feelings, that they even have um, um, opinions. That's hard. It, it is hard. And, you know, and I think, um, and I, I'm not giving the betrayers a pass, but, but all, you know, they have no, they're at zero with emotions and emotional intelligence and right. all of those type of things. But, you know, I think even having the conversation of, I have a vision for us being able to, you know, to relate on a different level. I know you're not there yet, but here's what I'd like to work towards and how, how can we, you know, navigate this? How can we negotiate it as you know, as a couple, you know, you know, are, can you show up, you know, in, in some small way, like, you know, and maybe be very specific. I'm hopeful that you could do this. Is that something you could do now, you know, and we can work towards some of these bigger things, but, but just, you know, giving the vision that, um, that there is, um, a, a possibility of, you know, a, of a future, but I don't expect you to be there now, you know, can, can also help but I, and I really agree with Kristen, like you work with a professional for these, you know, when it's too hard for the two of you to do it on your own, you know, um, and it isn't like you, it isn't, uh, it isn't admitting defeat. It's a going like, Hey, we need a little help. And yeah. we want, you know, we want the best thing for our relationship. So how do we do this? You know, that is supportive of each of us and the relationship. Right. Um, next question. I have some new contacts, so you see me squinting, sorry. Can you give me a short script of what I can say when my 30-year-old daughter is giving off huge nonverbal cues of rage? I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I'm like, okay, you've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. uh, saying, you know, you got teenagers, so uh, saying something like what I could do to help you right, or what, what I could do to help you right now seems to make it worse. Daughter is delightful, but a victim of an entire childhood of, of dealing with her SA father. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so glad you're asking that question too. Yeah, I know. And this is where uh, my therapist countertransference comes in because I can jump into like a high conflict coupleship and I'm like, oh, I know how to do this. We talk about daughter relating as I have two teenage daughters that are in that emotional state. And I'm just like, I don't know anything, <laughs> but let me try. Um, so since it's been related to me, uh, again, I try to be their inner monologue that they might not even be aware of because they're in so much emotional turmoil. So um, my daughter's stressed about finals. So she's being very curt and saying things in ways that are not usually the way she says things. And so I will say like, hey, do you think you're talking like this because you're really stressed about finals or what's going on here? Um, I kind of try to, when because I'm in touch with the story I'm telling myself when I see it happen, right? So I see someone who normally isn't stressed or curt or unkind, um, then I, so I'm like, ooh, this isn't like her. These are the things that are going on. I wonder if X, Y, and Z is what's leading to this behavior. So I will kind of be the person that speaks up and says, hey, do you, what's going on here? You know, either I'll say like, um, this reaction seems really strong. Um, do you think it's about more than just this? You know, or I'll see stiff body language and I'll say, oh, you're like, you, your body looks like it's really stressed right now. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. You're picking up huge nonverbal cues of rage. So you see them. So note them. What do they look like? Do you hear it in a tone of voice? Do you see it in like a tight body? And you can just say, oh, like your body's so tense. Like, are you angry about something? And cause she could just be like, no, I'm just really cold in this room. It's freezing in here. I don't, right. Like you can, you can invite conversation about it as much as you want, it might not always work. Um, but as long as you're the one who tries to stay calm, non-judgmental, remember this is their neurofeedback loop system, not yours. You're just noting that they look unsafe, they look unhappy, they look angry, and you're more just kind of inquiring 
I see this. Am I accurate? Am I not? What, what's going on? Like, help me understand and see you better. Remember the, the saying that I love for communication, um, listen to understand, not to respond, right? So you can even also ask questions to understand not to be responsive or to change their opinion or to influence them. Not say, why are you so angry? Everything's fine, right? You don't say that. You, you say, you, you look upset. Help me understand why, what's going on. So hopefully I I've use, you I'm that. curious a lot. Okay. And that, Help me yeah. understand. Yeah. I yeah, say, I'm confused. Yeah. Yes. Help yes. me understand. Yes. Like and, six times a day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, having a conversation when it's not happening and just say, you know, like, I, like I see these things and I, I want to support you. Is there something that you would find useful when those things are happening? The other day there was, I don't know, I actually probably would remember, but my daughter who's visiting for Christmas, you know, was like, mom, you're spinning. And enough said, like she was, and I was like, she's right. And then I, you know, I was like, okay, I have techniques I can use that will keep me from, cause I was going, you know, and, and, but her just going, mom, you're spinning. That was it. And like, I, I, I didn't have to unpack to her. It was just like, oh, I need to go do what I needed to do. And then I wasn't spinning like a top anymore. And it was good. Yeah. So, but, but having, because we've had those conversations, not in the moment, you know, that's all she needed to say. So I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to have a conversation about, you know, I, you know, it, it, it hurts me to see you so upset. Is there anything that would, I can do to be supportive? You know, when you get like that, is there something, you know, that would help you, you know, and then like Kristen said, at some point, you know, everybody, she's an adult, she gets to pick, yeah. you know, how she, invite it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as you're saying that, it, the mom, you're spinning uh, the cue I've used with my kids and they've used it on me and it's been quite effective. <laughs> is, can you say that in a nicer way? Oh, yeah. like, can I, I know what you're trying to say, but mm -hmm. can you say it in a nicer way? And most of the time, I'm like, yeah, I absolutely could say that. In a nicer way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are so right. Yeah. yeah, but, but that's just, you know, it's an invitation to do things a little differently. Oh, yeah. You know, and just, and I think it helps it get it up here to go, yep. oh, you know, because I'm sure when I was spinning, everything was back here. Right. And it went up there and I went, oh, yeah, I am. And this is not productive. So, right. And what she's trying to say is that when you're in that reactionary state, you're in this back survival brain that I've talked about that fight, flight, freeze, you know, stress state usually it's in your executive functioning brain that by the way you have to be curious you have to breathe you have to allow time and blood flow to occur to be up here to be like oh yeah these are my children I love them they are my <laughs> treasures I want to treat them with respect because I want them to be to expect other people to be you know treat them with respect mm -hmm. oh let me adjust my <laughs> my mentality mm -hmm. and the way I'm speaking so that just takes time and you can, if you can add curiosity to it and time and breathing and oxygen and blood flow, that helps. And what, a, I mean, like, how real is that, that you are showing your children that they are empowered, you know, to say, can you, can you say that in a different way that might be, you know, nicer? I mean, like, this is how children can learn to do life in a different way and not have to, you know, hopefully struggle in certain ways that some of us have so so the next one I'm the betraying partner and I think I'm in fawn quite a bit with my wife and with a lot of my a mom growing up um, my wife holds the upper hand in my perception because she is threatening to leave all the time due to my betrayal that is my biggest fear any advice for me um, exercises I can practice so remember the goal is not to subvert your feelings and experiences. It's hard because again, you, you've not assessed if it's safe to do so, but you know it, you know the, the story you're telling yourself. So you need to start sharing that with her. So when you feel that moment, so get familiar um, with what it feels like in your neurobiology, when it feels like something's happening and you kind of freeze and you start wondering how to avoid the conflict or please her or de-escalate the anger, pay attention to it. So the cue can let you know, Ooh, I'm in that state. You might want to, even when you're not in that state with her, share what you're going to be doing, which is like, Hey, I've noticed 
I go into this plea as a peace state. I'd, I'd like to not because I'd like to be real, have real conversations with you, um, you know, have talk about hard things. But this is the fear that goes through my mind, which you're not alone. This is an extremely common thing that happens is, you know, kind of once you've been discovered, all of a sudden that's when you guys start doing relationship dialysis, seeing what worked or what didn't work, how can we better, how can I support you, how can I help you heal? Um, but the betraying partner will often be in that fond state of like, can I have opinions? Can I have feelings? What are my feelings? What are my opinions? And it kind of comes out and like either like explosions or not at all. So you can say it and like bring that inner monologue out and say, I'm going to try to share my feelings. I'm going to try to stay present with you. Um, but I'm in so much fear about you leaving that I just have, it takes me a little bit extra time to like breathe and calm down and then show up. So I have another video that's called, um, how trauma impacts your nervous system. And I talk about the polyvagal theory. Um, and that might be really good to help you down, down escalate or kind of, um, down regulate your really upregulated system because fawning, pleasing and appeasing is still a sign that you are very overwhelmed, that your nervous system is overwhelmed. So you do need to engage down regulation skills of, you know, deep breathing, um, counting back from 100 by seven, um, try doing that, uh, mm -hmm. st stand on one foot, sigh. These are ways to calm down the system and say, you're safe right now. She's not packing her bags and leaving you. She's trying to understand why you missed that 12 step meeting last night that you were supposed to go to. So just breathe and have a difficult conversation around it. But and check and, out that the video. Yeah, and man, I really think as Kristen suggested, when you're not in that, having the conversation of we're if we're looking to repair our relationship, you know, uh, this this doesn't feel productive for either of us. Is there a way we can do this differently? You know, and we've talked before on these, you know, with timeouts of like, okay, when we're escalated, you know, I need a 20 minute timeout. We will come back. I mean, there's lots of techniques. I also threw in the chat um, a couple of books because you mentioned your mom. So I'm, I, you know, not making anything up, but uh, Silently Seduced by Dr. Ken Adams. He also wrote When He's Married to Mom. If, if there was some enmeshment type of behavior by mom, Mom, you may find some of uh, that useful. And then uh, Enid Gray wrote si uh, uh, Neglect the Silent Abuser, which when when parents don't have the bandwidth for a lot of reasons that, you know, they're working multiple jobs or, you know, you know, single parents or mentally ill or addicts or wh whatever, there's lots of different reasons. You know, then um, then we learn to not have needs and we learn to do all of those, you know, the fawning makes a lot of sense, you know. So I wonder if, you know, looking at those. And then I also, after I sent that, um, Troy Love, who does the fourth week of the month on here with attachment wounds, you know, I have to believe that your your attachment wounds are getting poked. And so, you know, mm -hmm. exploring some um, some of those type of things, you know, the what I hear is the fear of abandonment. So I too struggle with an abandonment wound and, but right. being able to name it, being able to know when it's getting poked, having techniques to be able to use has helped me so much. So, so that one will be starting uh, two seven on the seekingintegrity.com uh, website, but um, you'll find the list of books, including Kristen's um, on the sex and relationship healing. You'll see a whole list of, of books and, and resources and, you know, previously recorded webinars as well. So, yeah. Um, and, and Tammy beautifully ahead. explained all that stuff that needs to be unraveled. Like I said, the opposite of fond response isn't just all of a sudden asserting yourself. It's definitely unraveling, you know, the trauma history, the complex trauma, the shame voices of fears of abandonment and all that kind of stuff. So it's not just as simple as just asserting yourself. I wish it were that easy, but it's not. No, no and there's a reason why, you know, I mean, the, the betrayal, I mean, your partner has her own, you know, um, right. uh, you know, betrayal wounds. And I'm, I mean, like that's a, the challenge is when, you know, 
all these wounds are getting poked, you know, and you know, so it's how do we not poke each other's wounds, but how do we also get support, you know, and it, and it may be from support systems, not from each other initially, you know, to be able to move forward. So the first person that um, mentioned uh, the avoidant uh, said that they've been, you know, he's in three years. Um, so, so not new, may, right. Right. So it may be, so, I mean, time. we can push a little harder with yeah, like, yeah. it's been three years. I need to hear more opinions, more. I'm the story I'm telling myself is you're still pushing down your feelings, not saying what you're wanting to say. I, I need to know more. I need to hear more. I can handle it. I've, 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 I've seen worse. I've experienced worse. Like, yeah. let's go. Yeah. So it's clear that it is important to develop boundaries to help offset the desire to fawn and thus be more authentic in the relationship. Do you have any recommendations for a uh, resource to help identify and name my boundaries? This seems critical so I can communicate them and be a more, be more real in our relationship and express my needs versus fawning. Yeah. Um, well, I have several, the YouTube, so on my channel, Kristen Snowden, um, I have several previous webinars posted specifically on boundaries. I have like a, I feel a really helpful, impactful boundaries chart. I think it's like the number one most downloaded thing on my website. So um, I think it's really helpful to just review it every day and say, am I still staying and behaving and making choices that keep me on the healthy boundaries side? Or am I kind of fawning or people pleasing and, and responding on the unhealthy boundaries side? Um, I also do do live small group workshops, which actually are starting, uh, I think next week and we cover boundaries, um, a lot because it's really important to identify them, identify values, goals, um, who you want to show up as, how you want to show up, um, along with exploring shame, um, trauma, vulner, you know, the fears of, of vulnerability, et cetera. So those are helpful resources, but. You guys probably have some too, Tammy. Hey, yeah, on our, our websites, but you know, I I would invite you and, and Kristen just mentioned it, shame is not like if you fawn, you know, identify it and go, I can do this differently, but it doesn't have to go, oh, I'm you know, I'm so shame filled, you know, because that's counterproductive. So so it's always looking at things and how can we step into it differently, how can we engage differently? Um, but going to the shame spiral, you know, doesn't help doesn't help anyone. So so it is, you know, like in 12 step we talk about a searching and fearless moral inventory. Like with all of this, you know, we are we are we are looking at this so we can, you know, do things differently, um, not wishing to shut the door on it. So mm -hmm. next question, fawn is my go-to response. And I believe it's origin being my mother was so anxious that she could shut down at any point and not be able to function. Now as a betrayer, I find it hard to be vulnerable and completely open with my wife on, uh, uh, feelings, on probably. feelings and go to into fawn mode. How can I tell when I am in fawn mode versus sincere desire to show up for my wife and her trauma? That's a great well, question. How to I know. figure out like, and, and it's, cause those are it obviously lots. resonated it's, with a lot of people. Yeah. I can understand yeah. that. So you've probably seen my responses to previous questions because they're similar. Um, I, I do, again, there's a lot of videos that I have on like shame and fears of vulnerability. So I'd encourage you to kind of look at those that helps you really understand the multi-level levels of trauma and shame stories that you tell yourself that lead to that fond response. The more, you know, um, believe it or not, intimacy and having connections with your partner, um, showing up for your wife is to even say like, you're in a state of trauma and I don't know how to show up for you. Like, help me understand. I'm frozen, afraid that I'm gonna say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. Do you need a hug? No, 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 get away from me. Okay, can we, can I come back? When do you want me to come back? Uh, come back in three hours, okay. And then in those three hours, can we sit down for a cup of coffee? Can I take you out? You get, to just let that inner monologue inside you out um, and just say like, help me understand what do I do with my hands? You know, like, because mm -hmm. fawn mode is, I didn't, 
do anything with my hands. I did whatever you told me what to do. I, I don't even know, but it's like, I feel fear. I'm afraid I'm going to make the wrong response. So you understand now that that's, that's the state that I'm in. Um, I want to say this. I want to, you know, share this with you. How, how can I do that and help you feel safe also? Um, so, yeah. And then obviously you're talking about what, what um, Tammy had mentioned about the story around mom and family history um, that needs to be explored right? Um, your fond response worked for a while until it didn't. And you need to explore the story you were telling yourself, um, how you thought you were serving yourself and others by fawning, people pleasing, et cetera. How do you really want to show up? What is that answer? Do you want to show up as being understanding, validating, being a good listener, um, helping someone else feel safe, feel heard? You're going to have to explore that and find out what the answers to that are. Those aren't natural states. So um, especially if you have addiction <laughs> issues, you know, they're multi, multi-layered. Sometimes you guys can do it in therapy with role-playing um, or just you alone with your therapist in role-playing. You can process it with maybe sponsor in your community. It's going to take practice and it's going to be an imperfect execution. And you'll do it better with people that aren't like, you know, it's why in treatment, like the guys can work on these skills with other addicts because there's less risk, you know, your, your most vulnerable relationship are the, you know, the people that are closest to you were, you know, we have the most fear we're, we're, you know, we, you know, we don't want to do it wrong. We don't know how to change those patterns. It's really easy to get into you know, the same little loops repeated that don't serve either of us, but that we don't know any better. So, so sometimes yeah. it's practicing with, you know, your peer group, with your recovery group, you know, that may be how you start to develop better skills for it. Yeah. Okay. Let me jump down really fast too. Someone's asking me, is the boundaries group just for women? No, I, the, when I do the Brene Brown, like Daring Greatly workshop, that's co-ed. Um, when I do betrayed partner workshops, it's just female, uh, it's just for women. Um, so my Brene Brown, you know, the, I call it courageous connection, daring greatly, rising strong, shame, resiliency, boundary setting, understanding fear and vulnerability workshops that that is co-ed and small. It's not usually more than seven people. I like to keep it really small. And I put the link, but for those of you that are listening on YouTube, it's on the Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N. Snowden, S-N-O-W-D-E-N.com website. You can find all of her resources on, you can find previously record, no, previously recorded uh, webinars of, you know, from hers. I also put in the chat, Gavin Sharp did in December, a great webinar on boundaries for addicts. Cause you know, like it, it right. like people often don't think that addicts, you know, get to have boundaries. You do, you need, you need healthy boundaries, but he talked about why it's important, how to set them up and everything. So that might be a useful, uh, you know, so previously recorded webinars, including Kristen's are all on uh, that on the sex and relationship healing.com site under the resource tab, you'll see them. So, and then the last question, I am the addict of three decades plus discovery a year ago. I am in 12 step, have a sponsor, attend a weekly group uh, session. I assume that means with a therapist. Um, I just finished sex porn addiction uh, 101, uh, reading out of the doghouse. I think uh, you get my drift. My wife and I still together, living together, taking uh, talking, etc. However, she's very often brings up past horrible decisions. Would you agree or disagree with the following statement? We need to stop focusing on the past and focus on today and our future. Mm. So I'm glad you're reading out of the doghouse because mm -hmm. that's going to talk about the fact that there's a need. Oftentimes what's happening to help you understand the betrayed partner is now that she's kind of realized that you had all this double life um, nefarious behavior going on in the backdrop for her own safety. She's trying to reconcile that in her brain. How did she see this person, her partner as this? And then he or she was off doing all this stuff in the background. So a lot of these questions are just her trying to make sense, trying to, to seek safety and better understand how could you make all these bad choices 
And why would I trust you to not do that stuff anymore? I mean, I know one of the steps you mentioned, you were doing all this stuff discovery. So I don't know if there's been like a full therapeutic disclosure, um, but the quick answer is there's going to be quite a bit of focus on the past for quite some time until there are signs that you know the ins and outs of how it happened, how to avoid it, what it was all about, um, all the feelings and the experiences and the trauma that you were kind of just piling on top of to avoid it. Um, and that she feels like you have appropriately assessed everything and changed and have a great understanding of it. And she understands it because a big safety thing for her is that she's going to know the cues. She wants to know everything, the ins and outs so much that she's going to know the cues if and when you start engaging in these behaviors again. Um, and I'm sure, Tammy, you have a lot to add about that. Well, three decades. And, and you know what? I mean, that's the behavior. I, the the wanting to dissociate the the maladaptive coping mechanisms probably started even younger than that. You've been doing this for a year, great, and that sounds I mean I'm like seriously as a fellow recovering person, yay! But but you know if you're doing the math, that's one year to thirty years. You know one thirtieth. That's a very short amount of time. It takes partners. You know a, when you actually stop the behavior and are starting to do the right things. You know they're looking at. You know it's typically you know twelve to twenty four months before they start going. Okay, now I see that this person is changing. You know it's what your actions are doing, and you're doing a lot of uh, you're doing a lot of right things. So stay the course, keep doing it. But it would be really lovely if as addicts, we could go, well, we're all done talking about the past and all of that rotten stuff. And now we're just going to focus on the future and Disney World. That isn't that isn't the reality. So part of doing the 12 steps, which, you know, because you're doing it is we don't, you know, part of the promise is we don't want to, we don't regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. So if you are doing the 12 steps and you've done your fourth and fifth step and you're working on things, you know, you're going to, part of the promise is you're going to know, know a new happiness and a new freedom. And, and you, you won't, you know, it, it won't always be all consuming, you know, the past, um, uh, and, and you can understand, hopefully in your brain, they're bad decisions. They were fueled by addiction. They were fueled by lots of pain or needing to escape. You're looking to do it better. You showing up in a very different way. Read, reread out of the doghouse. I also put, we started an out of the doghouse work group. It's full. Right. Um, we're going to start another one, uh, February 1st, and that will help you and support you. Um, and hopefully, as Kristen said, you know, if you haven't done a formal therapeutic disclosure, hopefully both of you are working with, you know, professionals to be able to, you know, have that on the, the plan as well. That'll help set the foundation, you know, for your spouse to be able yeah. to, you know, to b believe that there's, you know, truth and, and, uh, and, and trustworthiness. So, yeah. And let me give a skill for the addicts really fast. That might be helpful. Remember I talked about, we need to view, it's really helpful when you cannot personalize mm -hmm, um, something mm -hmm. coming at you from your mm -hmm, betrayed partner, because mm -hmm. they're dealing with so many different things right now and just view them as a, a nervous system feedback loop system. So if she's coming at you with something in the past, something about poor decisions you made, how could you just take it as a feedback loop system and say, it looks like you're feeling really unsafe. It looks like you're really struggling to see whether I'm changing or I'm making the progress. How can I help you feel safe again? So, right? Like it's not, oh my God, how long are we going to have to relive the past? How many times am I going to have my bad choices rubbed in my face? Just view her as a nervous system feedback loop. And she is, her body language and her stories are showing you that she is not feeling safe. And you step back and you help her get curious. And you engage her and say, you sound really upset. You sound like understandably angry and scared. What can I do right now to help you? Well, I just want to make sure you're going to your meetings. Oh, well, I just want to make sure that, and you, that's the way you engage them, right? So she's talking about the past, but you can engage her in the present, in this moment to help her feel more safe. That's huge for the healing process. 
Yes. And it takes it away from, oh, she's attacking me and throwing this up again. You, you are, you are engaging her in a very different way. I, that was great. Thank you for sharing that, Kristen. So thank you all for joining us. Join us. Uh, so next week is Eddie Caparucci, um, but Kristen will be back in February. Uh, so the second week of the month, uh, you, Kristen will be back. So thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. And uh, make sure to just check out my website, join my mailing list if you want. And I do have some spaces open for those live workshops that are starting next week if you're interested. Great. I share them with so many people. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely pointing people towards your, your work. Great. Take care. All right. Bye -bye, thank you, everyone. everyone. Happy New Year.